My name is Reverend John Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg. I am also Major General John Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg, and I am a member of the House of Representatives, so you can call me Congressman John Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg. Let me share my story with you as we begin this evening, and I want to start to give you a time frame of where I am in my understanding of history, and I would also like to share with you just a little bit of some things that happened, but let me read to you a letter. It is October 23rd, 1789, to give you an idea of where I am, because so I know you're not there yet, and, uh, or have been, uh, don't need to go back there, but I am back there, but let me read to you this letter that came from my commander-in-chief, uh, my president, who was sworn in on April, in April of 1789 in New York as the first president. And when he was sworn in, his Bible was opened up to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Blessings and curses. And as he took the oath of office, when he finished, he said these words, So help me God. And he kissed his word. Probably a little bit of history you did not know, but in October of 1789, he sent a letter. Let me share with you the content of this letter, and then we'll take a look at some other things. Whereas, it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and to humbly implore His protection and favor, and to acknowledge with grateful hearts the many and signal favors of Almighty God, especially by affording these states an opportunity peacefully to establish a form of government for their safety and for their happiness. I recommend that on Thursday, the 26th day of November, 1789, be devoted by the people of these states to the service of that great and glorious being who is the beneficent author of all the good that was, that is, and that will be. Thanks for the peaceful and rational manner in which we have enabled to establish the constitutions of government for our safety and for our happiness. Thanks for the civil and religious liberty with which we are blessed. And in general, thanksgiving for all the great and various favors which he has been pleased to confer upon us. And also that we may then unite in the most humbly offering our prayers and supplications to the great Lord and ruler of nations and beseech him to pardon our national and other transgressions to render our national government forever remain a blessing to the people by constantly being a government of wise just constitutional laws discreetly and faithfully obeyed and executed to promote the knowledge and practice of true religion and virtue and grant unto mankind such a degree of temporal past prosperity as he alone knows to be best. Washington penned that letter, thanking God for the fact that we came up with the Bill of Rights. I say we. In 1789, the men who were assembled in Philadelphia to sign the Bill of Rights debated over and over on exactly what we were going to do and how we were going to take the Constitution and apply individual rights to the Constitution. Now, please understand, in, in 1776, when the Declaration uh, was written, that was the principles for what we stood for. But understand that the principles need protection and a process. So the process was the Constitution, and the protection was then the Bill of Rights. I was there. I was a member of the House of Representatives at that time. As a matter of fact, my brother, Frederick Augustus Muhlenberg, who was a Tory in 1777, is the first speaker of the House of Representatives in 1789. Probably you're wondering, how did you go from a Tory to being a patriot? Well, when the British come and burn your church down, it kind of gives you an attitude that says, by the way, I'm sorry, I'm no longer going to be a Tory. I am going to serve like my brother who I'd always argued with. He continually argued with me, and, and Dad would have to step in. He tended to take the sides of, you guys work it out and figure it out for yourself. 
So I did, and I chose to step in and be a, be a patriot from the beginning. But in 1789, as we're debating the Bill of Rights, understand very clearly the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion, nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And from what I can glean of what I'm seeing and hearing about your generation, Congress has gotten way out of line. Why has Congress gotten way out of line? Likely because the church has been silent, as the church was not allowed to be silent in 1776 and in 1789. But let me explain one thing to you that I think is very appropriate for your understanding of where we were. The First Amendment was debated for 60 days. Thomas Jefferson isn't even around. He's an ambassador to France. Nor will you find the words church and state ever mentioned in the Bill of Rights discussion. But it took 60 days to come up with that Bill of Rights, the very first one. And we had a problem in the middle of it. We argued. We couldn't figure it out, so what did we do? We stopped and prayed. But before we went to prayer, we fasted for three days. And we fasted together and then we went to church and we prayed and then we came out of church and began to debate and understand that the reality of this is not going to go anywhere unless we have Almighty God in the middle of it. It will not work. John Adams makes an incredible statement. He says that the Constitution was written for a moral and a religious people. And he said, please understand, it is wholly inadequate to govern any other people. The Constitution was written for a religious people, and to take religion out of it means the Constitution falls apart. It would appear, from what I have heard, that that may be the case you find yourself in this evening. But once that First Amendment was written, the Second Amendment was put there to make sure that it was carried out. Because the protection allowed the militia and to be able to arm ourselves against the tyranny of a government. And tyranny of government always occurs when individual rights are violated, when family rights are violated, when community rights are violated, when the church's rights are violated. By anyone saying that they have power over that particular form of government, that's a definition of tyranny. Tyranny can come in many forms. It doesn't have to come from the top. It can come from a group of individuals that say, oh, by the way, I think I know things better than you do. It is my time to tell you how you are to live. That is not the way it works in the freedom and the democracy and the re democratic republic that we find in Scripture that has set us in place to be exactly who we are. And anyone that wants to say that government has the ability to override freedoms that come from God is making a serious mistake. Our freedoms do not originate from government. They originate from the God who created government and the God who established this government based on the foundations and the truths of the word of God. That decision was made over a period of time to make sure that the freedoms that we were planning to have under the Constitution did not violate personal freedoms. But let me take you back a little bit in this story so that we can bring you up to how we got here, because maybe this is a history lesson you may not have heard, you may not know, but I would like to share it with you because I think it's important. When we look at the revolution, many would suggest that the revolution started with the Stamp Act in 1765. And likely, that would have been a good time and a good thing to start. And why was the Stamp Act so important? The Stamp Act was so important because we were concerned that somebody was going to tax our Bibles. It had nothing to do with the paper that a lawyer would send or the uh, information that somebody else would send or that stamp. But the real issue was, are you going to tax our Bibles? Previous to that, in 1764, the British came up with this great understanding that those pastors over there in that upstart nation probably need a bishop to tell them how to preach. And you can see how far that went because it didn't go anywhere. 
We were trained to read the word, we were trained to preach, and the Anglican church did not have the ability to put a bishop in this nation to control us. And that was a part of the revolution that engaged pastors. We will not be told how to preach the word of God. We will be preaching the word of God based on what the word of God says. We're smart enough to read it, wise enough to understand it. But let me take you to something that might have been even more of an issue for the revolution. Britain was concerned about their navy. So in being concerned about their navy, they would go into the channels of the wonderful seashores that we had and travel up the river, and then they would start scouting out five, ten miles away from the rivers. What were they looking for? Trees that were more than 250 feet tall. For what? Masks. And they would mark those trees on personal property and say, this is not something you can cut down. It belongs to the king. No, sir. It belongs to the people who are here. It is not yours. When George Washington decided to form a navy, he put a navy together, which was a bunch of schooners that were a little bit quicker, and we specifically made sure that our people would know what was a part of our navy. We had our own flag. Interestingly enough, it's probably a flag that should be flying everywhere in America today. It has a pine tree on it, recognizing that reason. And the title of the flag that was flying over the Navy ships that we put together during the revolution was an appeal to heaven. Do you think America needs an appeal to heaven right now? I step out of character only for a second. Yes. But back to my story. That was in 1760. And everything built. It continued to build until in 1776 we made that decision to stand up and say, enough is enough. Freedom is granted by God. Not by a king, not by King George, not by any man, but by the God of creation. So that takes me to another part of my story. Early on in my life, I, was spent, I spent a lot of time running through the woods of Pennsylvania. My father, Henry Melcourt Muhlenberg, is the founder of the Lutheran Church in America. He was sent to trap Pennsylvania and I spent time traveling through Pennsylvania. And I remember just enjoying the realities of playing in the trees until one day dad said, by the way, son, it's time for you to get your education. Wasn't too fond of books like the fishing poles and like the hunting gear, but I've read scripture, honor your father and your mother. So I did. I went to, back to Germany, Heil, Germany, and entered into the German school because I'm German, German Lutheran. And when I got there, I was told that I was going to be in the service for a gentleman by the name of um, Herr Nehemiah. And Herr Nehemiah ran an apothecary, and I was going to be able to go to school and go back there and find, find health and find clothing and find all sorts of um, the needs of somebody that's going to school. Well, the arrangement that my father had with Herr Nehemiah did not work out quite the way my father had intended, for I was poor, starving, and cold. And after about a year of trying to honor my father's word, I decided enough is enough. I will go join the Dragoons. Well, the Dragoons, I loved them. Why? Because they were fighting. And here I am at a strapping 20-some years old. I'm ready to fight, so I joined the Dragoons. However, I didn't realize that when you join the Dragoons, you join for life. So here I am stuck in the Dragoons in Germany as a fighting group of individuals. Good thing for a gentleman by the name of Ben Franklin, who I have been so thankful to have borrowed these glasses from. Well, I really didn't actually borrow them. He had a several of them made and decided to give me a set of them. By the way, I'm Ben Franklin's vice president 
1783, from 1783 to 1787, because Ben Franklin needed at least somebody that had enough smarts to help him out because he was getting a little senile in his, in his older years. And so I was asked to be vice president in Pennsylvania from 17. 83 to 1787, but I, but I digress a little bit, but I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to get out of the dragoons and, and obviously my father's connection in uh, Germany and Ben Franklin allowed me to be removed from the dragoons and I came back to Trap, uh, Pennsylvania and was there for a short period of time before some Germans in the northern part of the state of Virginia in the Shenandoah Valley, the state um, area um, needed a pastor and so they came to my father and they asked my father who would be that individual and my father said well I have a son not really sure quite if he's ready but I think he is so uh, they called me to Virginia I came to Virginia and pastored several churches in the Woodstock Virginia area but in 1772, things began to get very ugly. Britain had decided to blockade Boston. Men and women were starving. Boston sent money to the Shenandoah Valley to buy crops. And we would send the crops back up to Boston so that they would be fed. And it became very apparent to me that war was soon to break out because you do not treat individuals that way. So I joined the Committee of Safety and the Committee of Correspondence in 1772, went to Williamsburg and was actively involved in the House of Burgesses. I was there when Patrick Henry gave his Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death speech, one of the most powerful orations I have ever heard. And I hope it is one thing that you still today know is a powerful message asked not uh, as he was as he was speaking I know not what course other men may take but as for me give me liberty or give me death in 1776 January 21st I preached my last sermon from Woodstock Virginia's church where I preached out of Proverbs 3, there is a time for war. Ecclesiastes 3, there was a time for war and there's a time for peace and now it's the time to fight. And later on, three months later, I led Virginia's 8th Regiment south to a place called Charlestown where I contracted malaria and still struggle with it even today. But a couple of things during the Revolutionary War as I get to where I want to close, I understand that... Um, uh, there's a black pastor that will be sharing after me, and I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say as well. Because I did know several black pastors. As a matter of fact, the, there was a black pastor that led the largest white church in Philadelphia during the Revolution. There was a black pastor whose name is Black Harry Hoosier, who you might have heard that name being associated with one of those states out in the Midwest, but that's where it came from. It came from a black pastor that would sing his sermons and he was such a simple man that in the singing of his sermons they called individuals Hoosiers who were simpletons and one state in the Midwest I believe has adopted that name there was a battle at Monmouth I was wearing my clerical robe the pastors would wear clerical robes because they were the leaders of the militia in the Revolutionary War. John Adams also makes a statement. He said, had it not been for pastors, we would have never won the Revolutionary War. But I'm trying to gather my team together, my, my militia, as we're in battle. And up on the hill, I hear a name that was familiar from the German dragoons. Teufel Pete! Teufel Pete! Devil Pete, I'm not sure why they called me that, but that was the name they were calling me. They knew who I was, I knew who they were, and because they knew that I was on the other side, they rode off and the battle was over. Now, had they attacked, I'm certain we would have won, because we really believed that divine providence 
led this nation to be established for what it was established to be. I want to take just a, a couple of minutes to close with something that was uh, penned a little bit after that time that I believe would be very beneficial for us to hear today. And, and may I encourage you in your time over the next several days to go back and read a passage out of Deuteronomy which in the eighth chapter. I'll read two verses but I think the remaining verses of that chapter would be quite appropriate. When thou hast eaten and art full thou then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he has given with thee. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day. Verse 19 says, And it shall be if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day that ye shall surely perish. And the nations which the Lord destroyeth before your face, so shall ye perish, because you would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. Hear these words. The blood that stained the ground during the revolution did not rush forth in joyous frenzy of a fight. It fell drop by drop from the heart of a suffering people. We fought not for conquest, not for power, not for glory, not for our country alone, not for ourselves alone. We fought to retain the individual freedoms given to us by divine providence, not to subject ourselves to an elitist view that divine right was granted by kings. The Holy Writ offers only hardship for those who demand a king. We served in the war for posterity. We suffered for the human race. We bore the cross of all people. We died that freedom might be the heritage of all. It was liberty herself that we had in keeping. You do well, my countrymen, to remember that time. You do well to honor those who have yielded, who have yielded our lives. Ours was a perfect sacrifice. The debt you owe us, you can never repay. Your lives have fallen on happier times. The boundaries of your union stretch from sea to shining sea. You enjoy all the blessings which providence can bestow, a peace that we never knew, a wealth that we never hoped for, a power of which we never dreamed. Yet think not that these things can make you a great nation. We laid the foundation of your happiness in times of trouble and days of sorrow and put complexity, of doubt, of distress, of danger, cold, hunger, of suffering and want. We built it up by virtue, courage, self-sacrifice, unfailing patriotism, and unceasing vigilance. By those things alone did we win our liberties. By them only can you hope to keep freedom alive. Do you revere our names and follow our example? Are you proud of our achievements? Then imitate them. Do you honor our memories? Then do as we have done. You owe something to America, something which needs as much in her prosperity today as ever in the sharpest cries of our age. For you have duties to perform as well as we. It was ours to create. It is yours to preserve. It was ours to found it is yours to perpetuate. It was ours to organize. It is yours to steadfastly defend. And what nobler spectacle can you present to mankind today than that of a people honest and secure, mindful of the lessons of experience, true to the teachings of history? Remember again our sacrifice, our humiliation, our walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Out of the mire, life in America arose, regenerate and free. Believe in our legacy with an abiding faith so that you will see that life is dear and liberty is sweet and the pursuit of happiness is glorious as they were to us and in doing so you will bless the remotest generations in times yet to come. And unto him who holds in the hollow of his hand the fate of nations and yet marks every sparrow's fall 
Lift up your hearts this day and into his eternal care. Commit yourself, your children, and your country. You are called to be salt and light. You are called to be Christian citizens. You are called to no longer remain silent. God bless you. When I take my wig off, I get to be me. <laughs> I've enjoyed um, studying John Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg, and one of the reasons why I carry the hat is because it reminds me of the sacrifices of those who went before. Um, we obviously are in a place where America needs the church to rise up. And unfortunately, it's going to take more than just pastors to do it if we can even get pastors off of their ecclesiastical shock absorber and start doing something. Um, as you know, I, I tend to have a reasonably strong opinion that the only thing that's going to save America right now is the church. And unfortunately, the church has decided that they're going to be quiet. I'm not going to be quiet. I cannot be quiet. This gentleman cannot be quiet. This gentleman cannot be quiet. I'm hoping there are other men that can say, and women that can say, I'm not going to be quiet. Our world needs leaders. Our nation needs leaders. Not the kind of leaders that want to tell you how to do it, but the kind of leaders that can show you how to do it. And I, I want to just uh, call your attention to a couple of things, and then I want to introduce our next speaker. It gives me a great privilege to do that. Um, on the back table, there are, are three brochures. One of them is, uh, is about Muhlenberg. Uh, most of you uh, probably are new to that name. Uh, I believe he's the most important founding father that most Americans know not of because of all of what he did. So there's a brochure about that. Um, on uh, Friday, August the 7th, and Saturday, August the 8th, from fr Friday night from 6.30 to 9.20, and then Saturday morning from 9 to 12.50, I will be teaching American history from a biblical perspective. Seven hours of American teaching. It's a free seminar. It will be at Gilboa Christian Church, which is on 33, the church that I pastor in Mineral. And I would strongly encourage, if you want to know American history from a biblical perspective, we go from American history in 1607 to where we are now. Where did we start? How did we get off track? And how do we get it back on track again? So please take advantage of that. I know it might be a little bit of a traveling distance, but probably not too far, because most of you are in horselesses. And uh, a horseless carriage is a little bit easier to get you there than it would have been in the past. And then there's another brochure about call to Christian citizenship and some things that we can do uh, to make a difference. I'm uh, certainly glad to be in the battle. And please understand, it's a battle. And I want you to know that I stand probably with most pastors that I am familiar with and, and would say that I will not compromise the principles that I believe the Word of God gives me and in not compromising the principles, I'm ready to go to jail. Because you know what? There are individuals in jail that need to know Jesus. So my wife and I have talked about this. We recognize that truth. But I'm here to tell you that um, we, we entered into a new stage of Christianity or our ability to be Christians on Friday because that is the camel's nose that got stuck under the tent. And unless we stand firm and stand maturely and stand correctly, that tent the camel wants to get all in, and I think we all know what that's going to look like. So we have to stand true. So I will be around uh, to share and to talk with you. Thank you again for being here.